Welcome to the Nonprofit Report, your update on nonprofit organizations, issues, and leaders. I'm your host, Mark Oppenheim. Today, we're talking with Craig Redmond of Relief International about the work that Relief International does around the world, working, I think, Craig, in 16 countries. It's just so wonderful to have you here. And Relief International does such important work at this time of conflict. Could you just give us a sense of how you were founded? But also, I mean, you're running, in, you're first responders, you're running into right. the line. Of fire. Your people are putting their lives in danger. They're trying to keep themselves safe. They're trying to keep the people they serve safe, but they are running into the fire. Uh, talk about the idea, the humanity behind that idea, sacrificing yourself potentially for the sake of someone else. Yeah, thank you, Mark. Uh, first of all, what a pleasure to be with you. Really, I look forward to this conversation, and thanks so much for having me and this for this opportunity to talk about uh, Relief International. Yeah, we are um, basically an alliance of four organizations. You have Relief International Incorporated, Relief International France, UK, and Europe, which allows us really to source income from multiple different donors, you know, around the world. Um, so that's kind of structurally, that's how we work. I'm the CEO of all four of those uh, entities. Um, and then we have a single leadership team that oversees all of that. So it's not a distinct organization. It's not a, it, it, it's not a federated model in that sense. We're one organization that has that combination of four, four entities there. Um, you know, I love your question about what it means at this time in the history, I'll tell you, it's hard to picture a time that was with more upheaval than than right now. Um, you know, and I say to our teams all the time, I can't imagine a more important time for Relief International to exist. You know, our whole mission is we 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 work in, as you say, 16 countries, um, some of the toughest countries in the world. And we partner with communities who are experiencing the impacts of conflict and climate change and disaster, you know, to build greater resilience uh, and to have better health and well-being outcomes. That's why we exist, which means uh, we have to be ready to go into those places where things are very hot. Things are very dangerous, very kinetic. Um, and our teams are trained to do that. And that's why we exist. So, you know, for us, the question is when an event happens, whether it be in, you know, in Afghanistan or Sudan or Pakistan or Myanmar, the question isn't sometimes should we, it's rather why wouldn't we be there? So in terms of the background of people who cut, who run into the fire, you know, I, I, I imagine that we all think of ourselves as fairly capable individuals. But if there is a burning building, you don't want me running into the fire because I probably won't do any good. I'd get in the way and I might kill myself. <laughs> yeah. How do you, how do you um, select people? Um, what is their, what are their background that equips them to walk into a situation and know whether they are uh, in a serious um, a situation of danger or a serious situation of negotiation or a serious situation in which they can, organized resource, you know, all of these things are serious, but having the, the sense to understand how to respond in a particular circumstance is so important. I wouldn't have it. How, who, who are your, your folks, men and women? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, this is a really interesting distinction uh, of Relief International. 98% of us are from the countries where we work. So we're a very national team, 98%. So we're 7,000 people strong. 98% of those are, are national officers, which means they come with language skills. They come with contextual, deep contextual understanding. They come with an understanding of how to negotiate with government, how to work with community leaders. You know, they understand the dynamics of what's happening and what's likely to happen in a way that you and I as, as outsiders never would. So that's a starting place for that, you know, what does it take to be a first responder and what does it take to be impactful um, in that event? Um, but second, Mark, we do a pretty robust recruiting process, training process to make sure that we have the right people. And then once those team members are on board, 
that training goes on um, to make sure that number one, they are in, in terms of the technical emergency response capacity, they have that, but also the basic code of conduct kinds of things to make sure that they're acting in ethical ways and so forth, um, that they're the right people. So we take that process very seriously. And then once we have people on the Relief International team, you know what it's like, I mean, you're in this business as well. It, th having the right people and keeping the right people is more important than anything. You can have, if you have good leaders, uh, you can take a pretty weak strategy and make it work, right? And it's good leaders throughout the organization, right? When you're talking about good leaders, you're not talking about you and your direct reports. You're talking about people on the ground in I'm Sudan talking. or in the, the, the border between Syria and, and Turkey, right? I'm talking about ex exactly right. I'm talking about... I'm talking about those people who interact with the community members themselves, all the way from our drivers to our, our people who are directly interacting with community leaders, sometimes at the worst times of their lives, right? After a dramatic event has happened, as you, you referenced the, the earthquake in Turkey, Syria, the, the, the recent conflict in, in Sudan, you know, uh, uh, all of these things. You have to have people who are empathetic and deeply skilled in order to do this kind of work. And then laddering, you know, laddering up to more senior leaders, our country directors, our regional directors, and then the senior leadership team. Um, these are people that I, I have to say I, I deeply admire and I feel honored to be working with. I want to come back to, um, to some of the issues that you raised, but, I, but let's still follow this thread of ensuring that your, your people, as they conduct their work, are conducting themselves with integrity and that... Um, there isn't resource capture and so on. You said that you have a very strong um, interview regimen in terms of selecting and so on. But there's also the whole question of audits. Sure. Right? The most honest person when my family is in need is tempted. Um, how do you ensure that you audit your, your folks so that that temptation is also uh, caught if people succumb to it? Yeah, well, we, we have uh, several things in play here. Um, uh, number one, we have a pretty robust partner vetting process so that not only our own our own team, but because we partner so closely with community and local organizations that we're vetting those organizations uh, very carefully. And then making sure that we put them through a code of conduct training to s make sure that we are on the same page in terms of behaviors and professional ethics. And um, we have prohibited parties policies that we go through with each team. And then in some cases, an enhanced due diligence process that each team goes through, each organization is put through to make sure that we know who we're working with closely, both individuals and organizations, um, and that we feel confident in moving forward uh, with them as, as partners. So that's really an important part of, of what we do to bring people on board. And then Mark, trying to cultivate this culture of making sure that we we have a speak up culture. So so if you see something that isn't right or or you're asked something that isn't appropriate from an ethical perspective, you know, you feel comfortable saying something about that and you know where to go. And so we have a whole whistleblowers mechanism to make sure that um, people understand who they call what they, you know, how they reach out to the organization uh, to to make sure that their concerns are are heard, and then and they'll, be, and they'll be protected, right? And so exactly. if they if they're a whistleblower, they actually are treated as someone who is serious and whose identities need to be kept. Exactly. Yeah, and then and then when it comes to auditing, we have an internal audit team. Uh, so we have our whole uh, internal every country program is audited. Um, and we send the team out there to do a full audit um, and the, the findings that come out of that audit, we take action on and we report that directly to the board. So we have an audit and risk committee on our board that closely follows uh, the, the audits themselves and the findings and, you know, um, the degree to which we're responding to those findings. So that system is pretty robust and it has to be today because, you know, this is these are these are challenging times. And to make sure that we're operating in an ethical and appropriate way every time is critical for us to have the impact we want to have. Well, very important. And you have about 7000 people on staff and then you have, have a network of partners as well who are on the ground who are not part of your, your group, but collaborate with it. 
right? Exactly, exactly. I'll give you an example. Um, you know, right after the earthquake in Turkey, Syria, uh, I, I was there to meet our team. Um, that was an unbelievable time because, as you know, uh, um, in Turkey and Syria, the first responders are also survivors. So right. we have stories of team members who um, escaped buildings as they were collapsing, uh, made it through the night, and the next morning started responding immediately, getting their their family to safety, and they became responders themselves right away. And that also is true of our of our partners. Um, we work with um, a local organization in Turkey, a Syrian organization that builds prosthetics um, for people who have lost limbs as a result of the conflict or the earthquake itself. You know, these kinds of organizations are so essential to who we do. And that pride that we have of being such a national organization is also extended, Mark, to those, those local partners that we have as well. There's nothing like being able to multiply your impact by working with really, really strong local partners. Talk about the, the cultural aspects that help your people, your group, to remain steady in service to human beings in situations where people um, are enemies. You know, if I look, for example, you cited this, the Syria-Turkey uh, 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 border uh, and that earthquake. Well, you have um, uh, both Turkey and Syria um, uh, uh, viewing uh, some Kurds as the enemy. Um, you had both sides affected, both sides of that international border, the various uh, Turkish, uh, Turkic and, and uh, Kurdish people affected. It's so easy to start to tilt aid that comes in when, when, it, when it hits the ground to toward your favored group, right? How do you ensure that people stay centered in serving human beings, regardless as to where you know where they're coming from in terms of the po the political side or or some of the conflict side. Yeah, that's a really an important an, an important question. It's something that we talk about a lot as an organization and, and our sector generally. We're really animated by the humanitarian principles, and those four are so essential and are guiding principles for everything we do. Number one is this humanity. We're humanitarians. Where there's human suffering, that's where we go. That's that's our mission. So that that one is really so incre incredibly important. The second is neutrality. You know, a, a, as you say, um, we are a neutral organization. We don't take political sides. Um, we we don't choose camps. Um, you know, we go where we're needed, and we work on humanitarian issues. So staying neutral is essential, not only to being impactful but being safe. Uh, and then the third one is is impartial. We're impartial towards who the people who need the support are the people who get it. And finally, independence. You know, we, we don't we're a non-governmental organization. Uh, and that means that we're not uh, aligned to any one government. Uh, we're an independent entity. We're allowed, you know, according to uh, we're you know, our governments are signatories to um, instruments that that say it's important that we remain independent in or in order for us to go into places and to have the kind of impact we have. So those humanitarian principles are really uh, the guiding lights for us um, as we navigate the complexity of some of the places that we are discussing. Are the four principles part of the reason for your incorporated structure so that you're not um, captured by the incorporated laws um, of any one country, that you can basically retain your neutrality um, but still serve and still be uh, be allied with uh, country organizations, country funding that serves this purpose of, of humanitarian support? It's interesting you ask that. It, you, the, the humanitarian principles are ones that we bring up and talk about with our own board and with our senior leadership team you know, all, all the time. Every once in a while, there is a request for applications um, that in a certain context feels doesn't feel right. Uh, and we have that conversation. Is that a piece of work that we would want to do? Is that appropriate in this context? You know, no, it is not. Um, therefore, we we wouldn't do that. So, it, you know, these these are not some conceptual ideas that are that are that are, you know, set aside somewhere. They're living principles that we 
um, you know, that we struggle with and we work with and we define for ourselves all the time and we apply them to this very dynamic context in which we work. So that's an important question. And having these different entities allows us to work with different kinds of donors um, in different kinds of contexts, gives us that flexibility a little bit. So the interplay between the principles, our alliance structure, and who we are as a single organization is a constant push-pull. That's very interesting. Um, I have a question about the hottest of, of, of conflict zones, whether it's Sudan or whether it's the Palestinian territory in the Gaza Strip. Um, you, you've you got this, this situation in which you have warring factions uh, mixed amongst people, and you're, you're trying to serve provide the humanitarian service to to uh to people who are affected how do you how do you operate within such a hot environment um where you know you know for th there's no question that some of your aid ends up supporting the conflict because the people are interspersed amongst you know the the, the people who are driving conflict are interspersed among amongst the population. How do you keep yourself safe in that environment? How do you ensure that you're having your humanitarian impact? Or does it not matter whether somebody is trying to kill each other? As long as they have a need, you, do you supply it? How do you how do you make those distinctions? Yeah, it that's a, yeah, almost yeah. impossible. Yeah. That's a, well, I'll, I'll, I think the best way to unpack that one is to give you an example. Um, in March, uh, a year ago, uh, I was in um, Sudan. Um, and this was only a couple of weeks before the conflict started. The conflict, again, started in April of last year. I was mm -hmm. there in March, right before it, I was in uh, North Darfur, where a lot of the conflict is really raging. Um, and I was visiting our primary health care centers there. Relief International has a network of about 40 primary health care facilities that we run. These are those essential first stop places where if someone is injured or hurt or a mom is having a baby or, you know, those kinds of level of, of needs, that's where they go. And for us as an organization, those primary health care centers are for us philosophically the basis and, and the starting point for any kind of long term community resilience. We think those centers are a precondition for a community to have real resilience. So we, we, we take that work very seriously and about 70% of what we do is in that primary healthcare space. So I was at this clinic in North Darfur and, and I really saw how essentially important that was to all the community members. We have a water and sanitation point there. There's a, there's a, a solar powered, a, a water point where people can get water. That's where they get nutritional information. When there are any food distributions, that's where it happens. It's really this center point, uh, you know, for all, all of that kind of community, community work. And then the conflict happens. And most international organizations were, uh, forced to close down their operations and leave uh, the country. But we did not. That clinic that I just described to you stayed operational in North Darfur. It, it, even just a couple of days were we forced to uh, close down and go to ground. Why is that? Because those clinics are run by Sudanese professionals who understand the context. They know how to navigate the context. They know when things are really hot. Um, this is when we need to shut the doors and go to our, our our relatives in you know two villages over uh, to avoid the conflict until it's safe to do so. Then they come back uh, and they reopen. So we were able to stay open and provide services to community members who desperately need them uh, in in the context of something as dynamic as that as that crisis in Sudan. Elsewhere in Sudan, uh, with the other clinics. Um, some of them have had to turn into mobile clinics. So as community, communities are themselves on the run or they're displaced, our mobile clinics are able to move along with them and provide services along the way. So, Mark, it's a matter of us being very flexible and being um, really responsive to the changing dynamics on the ground. And our team members and our leaders, because they're national, because they understand the situation so well, are able to say, we need to pivot here and we need to pivot in this way at this time. 
uh, and we follow their lead. Okay, I'm going to ask a, a uh, even more um, fraught question. Um, in these in these situations, people are coming into your facilities shot up, and they could be shot up from either side. And so you must face, and your people must face circumstances where, in one bed, you're treating somebody who has been trying to kill the uh, the person in the other bed. How does how do you deal with that? I mean. Are, are you are you just basically saying at that moment that person is shot up we will treat them and the war stops at our door yeah you, you know it, that that situation um you know can happen um it's not a, as as common as you as you would think um for the most part military they have their own system of treating of treating people you know we just we just don't see huge numbers of soldiers coming in for treatment you know in in our facilities ours really are designed to serve the needs of community members themselves um they know this is about them uh they're they're staffed by people from those communities and so that that that's what they're for so it, it it's really not as much as an issue as as you would imagine but it is a neutral place. It's the the actual Absolutely. facility is is accepted. Is that a pre precondition that you feel that you are accepted by the various people in conflict zones as a neutral place? That is important. Where where respect for your values, even as, even as people are 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 trying to harm others, right? Yep. Respect for your values is a certain modicum of that because if there isn't then you just become a target yourselves. That's a really important point. And in fact, that whole concept of community acceptance is the centerpiece of our security protocol. Basically, it's a community acceptance says, if the community knows who we are, they know what we're doing, and they value and need and want what we're doing, they will keep us safe. So we don't have armed guards at our facilities. We don't travel with armed guards. We don't have... You know, we don't have any of that. What we have is community acceptance, and and that keeps us safe. I myself have seen a situation in which um, years ago I was in Afghanistan, and our plan was to go to Village X, you know, 50, 20, 50 kilometers up the road. And right before we left, we got a, we got a call from a community leader who said, no, not a good day to come. Uh, <laughs> let's change our plans, go somewhere else. I'll let you know when it's safe to come. And three days later, they said, you can come now, no problem. So that's an example of what community acceptance looks and acts like in practice. And without it, there's no way we could be impactful or or safe for that matter. So that's such an essential, essential tool that underpins everything we do everywhere in the world. Thank you so much for the explanation. We're coming to the end of our time, but I'd like to go over uh, two more issues. Uh, the first being uh, th this idea of how you put together uh, this team across linguistic, uh, racial, cultural lines in a way where power is actually shared and not dictated and where there is mutual respect. It's, it's inevitable that people coming from um, uh, uh, countries that are generally funding uh, uh, countries um, that that uh, those people end up doing things like fundraising, right? Um, they might also, if if they're from the incorporate the four incorporated entities, they might you might have finance and and tax and other people who are technical experts within those country environments, and then you have the various countries in which you serve, and you have different types of experts. Talk about how you build a management team to deal with not only the the objective technical sides, but also the human relations uh, sides and ensure that we don't end up with some sort of a top-down neo-colonialist kind of a, a structure here, both at the board and on the staff level, um, where there is the ability to have these organizations evolve very flexibly based on the talent of their people. I love that question, Mark, because that really that really gets to the heart of what we do as nonprofit leaders, doesn't it? So for me, it comes down to a few things. First of all, diversity is a superpower. You know, it's not it, it, it's not political correctness. It's not 
It is a superpower for any organization because all the research shows a diverse group of people comes up with a higher quality level of decision making than a monolithic group. Sort right? of like the Socratic method, right? The Socratic method is all about one person challenging another person because they come from a different point of view. They precisely. come from a different experience. What you're basically saying is that this idea of diversity, it isn't about skin color, right? It's about thinking, and it's about heart, it's about experience. Absolutely. It's a, the, the kind of diversity that, you know, my, my lived experience is different from yours and, and, and my skin color is different than yours. And, but where I grew up is different and, and the way I see it, the problems and solutions is different. And so making sure that we have that diverse group of people around the table, when we tackle huge, complex, not complicated, but complex issues, is absolutely essential. That that's number one. So, do we have that right mix of in you know a diversity of opinions uh, around the table? That's that's number one. And two, um, do we have crisp, well articulated, strategic uh, understanding of what we're trying to achieve as a as a team? Making sure that that uh, real clear articulation of mission and a shared understanding of what that is is absolutely essential, right? If in our brains and in our hearts, we're aligned and you think about the problem differently than I do, but essentially we're trying to solve the same problem, suddenly something really powerful can happen. And then Mark, third, I would just say, uh, you know, culturally making sure that we've established this culture in which, uh, you know, we, we, we talked about the speak, speak up culture, making sure there that, that you and I have um, a, a kind of relation between us where, where I can respectfully disagree with you or say, I think you're not seeing this in the right way. So if you have the diversity, you have strategic clarity and you have that culture in which you can have good old, good old fashioned debate, you can end up in a very much higher place than you ever could otherwise. So the, the final question I have really is related to this, this question. It's really about communication and it has so many different aspects. So in, in terms of, of cultural attributes, things that we learn from our families and so on. There are certain cultures where being verbally uh, penetrating um, is, is lauded, and for some, it's viewed as being in your face and offensive, right? How you look people in the eye or not can be both sides, can be interpreted both sides. There can be uh, gender distinctions. There, there are gender distinctions in all societies. Societies. There are preconceptions in all societies. And the, the, the challenge for communication is that management teams can become kind of disconnected. You've kind of already given us a hint by your stories of your travels to frontline areas of, of part of how you personally deal with that. You put yourself into the environment, allow yourself to be informed and corrected right by the environment in which you are. But how do you deal with these very fine distinctions? Because when we're serving clients, sometimes we we'll have a candidate who is fantastic, but their their communication style gives the board the impression, oh, they're not they're not charismatic enough, or they're not this, or they're not that, which is really a definition that comes from the board's own background, right? It's not it's not revealed wisdom. It's just that's how they they see it. It doesn't, right. and we you know. How do you how do you deal with that? Because you're dealing with so many different people. Yeah. So uh, many different perspectives. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, I think it's, it's it's a wonderful question. And we could you and I could I would love to do that sometime. Talk for hours on that subject alone. You know, the fact is, as a team, you have to create space for the differences between us and how we see the world and how we communicate. Um, sometimes we need to wait longer for one another to get to a conclusion. Some people, as you know, are are just good talkers and some people are good thinkers, but they need they want to write. You know, so for really important top issues and challenges that we as an organization take on, we'll offer them up and say, hey, we want to take this. We want to take on this issue next week. Uh, come ready to talk about that, giving people an opportunity to really think it through, whether they need to do a little bit of research or they want to do some writing on their own, or they just want to think and talk off the cuff. You know, uh, again, offering that opportunity for a diversity of thought 
and diversity of approaches to really em emerge and bloom in that conversation is what we're trying to do. I'm not saying that we get it right every time. Uh, and sometimes things are moving so fast. I do worry uh, that we're some leaving some some perspectives behind, you know, but um, making sure that we create that space uh, and and are respectful of the differences between people, whether they be you know, uh, the extroverts who love to hear themselves think out loud or introverts uh, uh, who are, you know, people who really want to write and think and are very thoughtful in that deep sort of quieter way. Man, we need all of it. We need all of it at the table if we're going to get this work right. This is the irony and the truth of the situation, right? You can't get it right because there is no right. There is no correct answer, right? But you can try to get it right. Yes. Knowing that it's impossible. Try, fail, because you will fail, because there Absolutely. is no one right. But try again and try again and try again. It's so important to everything that you do, this whole idea of getting it right, getting it right by people within conflict zones or disaster zones or, or just in places where people are in need, trying to get it right for your own folks, trying to keep everyone safe. It's been just a great pleasure, Craig Redmond of Relief International. Thank you, thank you, thank you so much for the work that you do. Thank you for sharing it with us. Please thank your people. Please thank I your board. Do. Please thank your communities. Please thank your partners. It is it is just an honor to have this time with you today. Oh, the pleasure is mine, Mark. Thank you so much for having me. It's great talking with you.